250 years of slavery, decades of Jim Crow, housing discrimination, and other forms of systemic racism. All of that has led to this, a shocking wealth gap between black and white households in the United States, an average gap of $850,000 that, some experts believe, can be solved by something long overdue, reparations to the descendants of enslaved black people. But how do we even determine who's eligible for reparations? And can the struggle for reparations in other parts of the world teach us anything about what needs to be done in the US? To understand why there's a call for reparations, there needs to be an understanding of the scale of slavery. It was a crime against humanity in which around 400,000 people were forcibly brought to North America. Over the centuries, 10 million enslaved people were legally treated as property in the United States, brutalized and ruthlessly exploited for free labor, which was used to establish the country as a leading global economy. In fact, one historian estimated that by 1860, enslaved people were, quote, worth some $3.5 billion, making them the largest single financial asset in the entire U.S. economy. That's around $115 billion today. When slavery was abolished in 1865, 4 million formerly enslaved African Americans were freed. But through their forced labor, they created billions of dollars in generational wealth for their captors and none for themselves. Back then, the U.S. government understood the need for reparations and passed an order to distribute 40 acres and a mule to all formerly enslaved families so they could build wealth and financial security. However, after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, President Andrew Johnson vetoed the allocation and returned the land to former slave owners. One way to reckon with America's past and current wealth disparity is through reparations that close the racial wealth gap. You should make direct monetary payments to the eligible recipients. That's economist William Darity. He co-authored the book From Here to Equality, which outlines one of the most comprehensive plans for what material reparations could look like. So we estimate that uh, this would require an expenditure of approximately $350,000 uh, per eligible uh, per eligible recipient, you get a figure of approximately $14 trillion. Reparations for the crime of slavery and its legacy have long been a subject of national debate. I don't think reparations for something that happened 150 years ago for whom none of us currently living are responsible is a good idea. And I think they're using what academics would call the theory of distance, you know? That something is too far in the past to have contemporary application. So it's easy to see why Congress has yet to pass H.R. 40, a bill that was proposed all the way back in 1989. It would set up a commission to study and consider a national apology and proposal for reparations for the institution of slavery and its subsequent racial and economic discrimination against African Americans. And while you cannot place a monetary value on slavery and its lasting effects, there's a precedent of reparations programs compensating victimized communities directly. Back in the US, the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 designated $20,000 payments to Japanese Americans who survived internment camps during World War II. The U.S. government has also made payments in instances where it was not the culpable party. Payments made to families that lost loved ones during the course of the 911 attacks, as well as payments that are being made to individuals who were held hostage in Iran at the end of the Carter presidency. Up to $4.4 million per hostage or their estates. In the case of slavery, the U.S. government did promise reparations. It's just reneged on it. In fact, when the U.S. finally issued an apology for slavery, it included the disclaimer, nothing in this resolution authorizes or supports any claim against the United States or serves as a settlement of any claim against the United States. Nor did the U.S. ever provide true reparations, a process consisting of three things, acknowledgement, redress, and closure for grievous injustices. It's vital that the federal government issue an apology because that will create the justification 
for the redress plan that follows. That brings us to who would actually receive reparations. Those direct payments would go to the roughly 47 million Americans who identify as black. But under Darity's plan, the requirements are a little more strict. First, black Americans would have to have identified as black, Negro, African American, or Afro American for at least 12 years before any reparations plan goes into effect. And they'd have to prove that they had at least one ancestor who was enslaved in the United States. One way to do that is using the census. If your ancestor was present in the 1870 census and was old enough to have been alive in 1850 or 1860, but you can't find that person in the 1850 or 1860 census, that would suggest that they were probably enslaved. That's because, before slavery was abolished with the 13th Amendment, enslaved people were not counted in the census. They're actually missing people from the 1850 and 1860 census, and their absence there is a potential indicator that they were probably enslaved. But while Darity's plan has received traction, it still faces opposition. The impression down here is that Caribbean people who live in the United States, black people, would not be entitled to any reparation paid by the U.S. government. But we are saying that's not right. We are saying that's divisive of the black population in the United States. We are saying that Caribbean immigrants have been harmed by that system through racial profiling, discrimination. See, the black population in the U.S. is pretty diverse. Most black people are foundational black Americans, meaning they're American descendants of enslaved people. Others are immigrants or the children of immigrants who came to the United States from mostly African and Caribbean countries. Those individuals may have ancestors who were enslaved, but wouldn't be considered eligible recipients for reparations in the United States. Descendants of the enslaved have a claim that's linked directly to the failure to provide their ancestors with the promised 40 acre land grants. And that's uniquely a debt that is owed to the individuals who were enslaved and it was not met and to their descendants. The second reason that's somewhat related is the fact that the current or existing racial wealth gap in the United States is a consequence of policies that have been pursued by the federal government that built white wealth to the detriment of black wealth. A major policy Darity is referring to is the Homestead Act of 1862, or H.R. 125, legislation to, quote, secure homesteads to actual settlers of public domain. The policy incentivized citizens to move onto and settle land that had been violently stolen from indigenous nations. It provided 160 acre land grants to over a million white families for a small fee, but excluded the 4 million formerly enslaved people from the program who had already been denied the 40 acre land grants they'd been promised. Through the act, 270 million acres of land was settled across 30 states over 124 years. Remember, owning land generates income, and passing land down to the next generation builds wealth. So the consequences of that decision are seen today. Approximately 45 million living white Americans have benefited from this massive asset building legislation. I would argue that virtually all black people throughout the diaspora, the African diaspora, have a claim for reparations, but they don't all have a claim for reparations from the United States government. The horrors of slavery and its consequences are not uniquely American. The transatlantic slave trade transported approximately 12 and a half million enslaved Africans across the Americas. The overwhelming majority of enslaved Africans were shipped directly to Latin America and the Caribbean. Spain and Britain shipped around a million enslaved Africans just to Jamaica. By 1833, slavery was abolished throughout the British Empire. But instead of compensating formerly enslaved people, Britain provided reasonable compensation to slave owners through a then 20 million pound loan, which British taxpayers fully repaid in 2015. According to one estimate, that's worth over 20 billion British pounds today. For decades, descendants of enslaved people have been fighting for reparations in these regions. And in 2013, several Caribbean countries united to form the CARICOM Reparations Commission, which developed a strategy for reparations that focuses on reparatory justice. The 10-point plan begins with the demand for an apology. 
which is followed by calls for repatriation, an indigenous people's development program, eradicating illiteracy, and debt cancellation, to name a few. CARICOM has sent letters requesting reparations from countries like Spain, France, Britain, and the Netherlands. The response was negative, for the most part. And no country admitted to the wrong, no country took responsibility, no country apologized, no country committed to repair. Today, we're still living with the legacies of colonialism and enslavement that have left black populations across the globe at a disadvantage. There is definitely a case that can be made that there has been a global pattern of exploitation of people of African descent. We're here to demand what's owed to us from the United States government. And despite incremental progress and different approaches to reparations programs, people across the Americas continue to fight for redress. Right now, this is a contentious issue. It's affecting relationships, world relationships, global relationships, country versus country disputes exist. I think reparatory justice would help the society to heal itself. Both people of African descent, African people, and European people. I think it will be good and beneficial to all of us. Reparations! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Reparations! When do we want it? Now! How do we want it? That is necessary! Uh -huh.